So yeah, my name is Imogen Flood Murphy. Everybody calls me Imo because it's just easier to pronounce. Um, and uh, I have worked within Red Hat for uh, 12 years and IT generally for nearly 23. Um, and because of that, being a woman in the IT industry for such a long time, I'm a really strong DNI advocate. Um, it's why I wanted to have this meetup. Um, the and those of you who were here last year um, will remember uh, this story that the year before I, I was lucky enough to go to Summit and present on um, women in IT. And it was the last session of the last day. And the immediate feedback that we got from everybody who was in the session was, why couldn't we have done this earlier? Why couldn't we have done this sooner in the conference that we would then have had all these um, people to talk to in the hallway track, to um, be able to just chat with and, and, and go for a coffee with, um, but we'd not met them until the last day. Uh, so at that point I started, uh, I came up with this idea um, to have a DNI meetup. Um, this is the second one we're doing, um, and obviously the first one in a virtual world. Um, there is no presentation as such. This is just a place to come for uh, people who are passionate about DNI, who want to see who else is here um, and chat. I have a few topics for us to talk about. Um, and so uh, if you are not one of the nine that we can put on camera, put your hand up or feel free to just join in um, in the chat uh and uh, to to answer the questions or comment on what other people are saying um first of all i would like to throw the floor open to everybody else and anybody who would like to introduce themselves to the group um now's your chance and if not that's okay too Lishka, you're muted the catchphrase of 2020 and 2021. I was just about to say that, yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Eliška Malikova. Uh, I'm part of uh, DNI Brno, work for Red Hat as a project manager. And um, about introducing myself, well, I'm representative for uh, neurodiversity community Brno and Red Hat. So if there is something that would, uh, you know, be um related to that topic feel free to reach to me i'm very happy to chat or or we can chat here of course oh jen i can see you have the dafconf cup don't you isn't it a beautiful thing it is absolutely beautiful it is i really like it i love uh, it that's all for my introduction just feel free to reach to me if you would like to and thank you Imo. it was really nice i'm really glad we were having this session uh this is uh this is a really nice and safe space where we can talk about all of it i'm very happy that we have this uh on the conference i think it really belongs on a conference that's for sure happy that we can do it online even hi I, i'd like to introduce myself uh, i'm maureen i'm based in boston i've um i'm part of the new uh DNI Center of Excellence in the office of the CEO at Red Hat. So, if there is anything that we can do from that point of view, from that new DNI initiative at Red Hat, uh, please let me know. And also, I've been supporting DNI at DevConf CZ and DevConf US for a couple of years now. When when we we're in person, I uh, ran the Diversity Scholarships program, but also supported the Code of Conduct. Uh, speaker coaching and attendee coaching initiatives with speaker coaching being uh, run uh, by uh, Eric Erlandson and um, um, and by uh, Lenka who who got involved with the one at DevCon CZ and also uh, speaker attendee coaching being run by Carson Wade and also the other things that I'm involved with is outreach and. I'm going to plug outreach in chat right now is the time for you to uh, apply as a mentor for it or um, until February 22nd, outreach applications are open for people who want to participate. So if you know anybody who wants to get involved in open source and doesn't have a job now, that that's a really good opportunity. 
I'll go ahead. Hi, I'm Marissa Garden. I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator. I am also on Fedora's Diversity and Inclusion team, and I provide support to them. I also have mentored for Outreachy a couple sessions in a row, and I'm going to be doing that in the upcoming round, a design internship. So excited to, about that. And also, fun fact, I was introduced to Fedora through an Outreachy internship myself. Um, I'm Jen Krieger and I'm your moderator. So just as a, a note, the cats, this one here is Kip, and this one over here is Finn, and they're not meant to take away from the topic. They're just uh, wanting to snuggle because it's still morning here in Colorado. Um, and I am going to be watching the chat channel uh, to see if anybody has any questions that we need to bring into the room. And if you would like to join the video and the audio, you're more than welcome to do so. You just have to go ahead and share your screen or not share your screen, share your video and audio and we'll let you in. Um, and we can hold up to nine people. So feel free, no, um, no pressure, but also we'd love to have you. Uh, Nils, no, I see all of Steph and Jen um, and everybody else in the in the chat. So maybe it's you. Um, I had to disconnect my VPN before joining um, because it was complaining about my uh, bandwidth for a video. So um, that might be the hint is uh, if you're on VPN, just disconnect that and straight to the internet. Um, Right, so uh, anybody else want to introduce themselves before we move on? Hi, I'm Steph. Um, I lead a, a portion of Linux engineering at Red Hat. I'm interested in the diversity of uh, the engineering teams in our company and uh, and and making sure that uh, we can we can connect to, to the the projects like Outreachy and others. Um, where there's people who are not white males, I guess, other diverse folks who would like to join, would like to be brought into um, our industry and our ecosystem. And so that's why I'm here to say hi. Cool. Well, thank you for joining everybody. Um, I think we can. Uh, get started on the questions uh, part, the topics. Um, and I guess the first question that I have for all of you is, do you feel like the new normal, this new virtual world that we're all living in has improved or um, reduced the amount of inclusion that we're seeing? Because inclusion seems to be the hot topic at the moment. Um, it's not just about getting diverse people into your groups, into your teams. It's also about making them feel included. Um, do we think it's it's improved or worsened the situation for inclusion? Silence. More participation in Fedora. So I'm not sure, like in the different Fedora events, though I'm not sure how inclusive those are, though I suspect we're reaching a lot of folks who weren't able to travel before. So I see it as more inclusive and we've had people asking to continue some of the, the online events even when we go back to, you know, in-person things. So I think it is more inclusive. I would agree. Oh, carry on, Antonio. Hi. Um, Hi. I would also address the science inside just sure. to work. Hello, everyone. I'm Antonio. Uh, I work at Red Hat for four years. I spent half of the time in Red Hat Italy, and uh, the last two years I relocated to Czech Republic. And I have just uh, joined the diversity and inclusion group in Brno, so I'm, I'm very new. Uh, but uh, I hope that I can also help and make a contribution. 
So I, I, I'm trying to think about the question that Imo was just um, uh, asking. I think that uh, for some aspects, there is uh, more inclusion. Like, for example, one of the things that I noticed, I started, when I started with Vedat, I was a remote, so I, I always work from home. And I have met my team for the first time after maybe 10 months, eight months, nine months, something like that. And I have noticed that uh, there was, uh, like, it, it was difficult to feel part of the of the community, which, which is in Red Hat, right? Uh, it was surprising for me when I went to the Brno office for the first time and I've seen uh, and felt how it is there. So what I believe is that now the fact that everybody's working from home has uh, increased the awareness about what is, what, about remote ease, right? So this is also some form of inclusion because it's um, it's it's somehow putting everybody to the same level and also pushing the people that are um, used to work together to do something to recreate that feeling. And it's touching also those that were not uh, used to that yet. I am in the I am an engineer, so I I know that many People in, in engineering are uh, fine working, uh, let's say, somehow alone or working from home because our work is not all, it doesn't always need interaction. I mean, you can do it via email, you can just find this kind of agreements. But personally, I was really missing uh, the connection with people and I can feel it now that uh, there are so many activities. Uh, so this is one way where um, I think we are more inclusive. And it's great also what Mari was uh, mentioning. I also tend to agree, but we also need to be uh, careful to bring these feelings and also uh, like to, to bring this awareness in the future, like when, when we will be able to all go back to the office. So that's the, the, the thing, because also when you open, to people and they feel more involved, it's also then uh, worse to, to step back and lose that feeling. So we need to be very careful to, to this aspect, I think. Yeah. Well, I, have a, I have a question of, uh, do you feel, does anyone who perhaps wasn't able to travel as much before now feel more on even footing because everyone's unable to and maybe someone who was only able to work remotely before never went to the office now is on more stable footing because everyone is in that position i think there are many reasons for one person not to be able to travel and i don't know all of them it can be also mothers that have kids so of course uh, it's it's maybe hard for them and they will feel more involved but at the same time we shouldn't uh, use it as a, a reason for not traveling i think we should still try to maybe find a solution to make it more and more available for everyone if it's possible i mean there are situations where it's really not possible but as much as possible we should push for people to live that experience rather than having it as a, a fake one let's say a surrogate i don't know how to say that sorry i am also not native english so sometimes i might use the wrong uh, terminology you're doing great antonio um surrogate is i think exactly the right word actually um with travel, um, so my role is one that doesn't travel, um, but I would travel quite a lot personally. Um, and so the last year that for me has really been Im impacted. I've not, I've not been home for the past year. Um, so I live in the Czech Republic, the UK is home. Um, and I've, I've not been able to go back, um, which is, uh, perhaps not around inclusion, but it is something that, that kind of sucks. Um, and I had a bunch of travel planned for last year um, that was changed because of the new normal. So. Uh, 
I think uh, Justin mentioned a good point that connectivity can be a huge disadvantage um, for some. Uh, that, that we are now also reliant on the internet and having uh, good internet connections and the right equipment that if kids um, are disadvantaged that they're not able to uh, go to school right now because they don't have uh, the right equipment to do so. So I guess it brings up different levels of inclusion um, that perhaps we haven't seen before. Um, I guess the next question that I have is what does inclusion actually mean to you personally? And I'm going to pick on somebody, uh, Marina. Uh, so for me, what does inclusion mean to me? Uh, you know, being able to, 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 to participate in, uh, like in our case, like development of a project in a community at work um, without it really mattering, like what background you are from. Uh, without being confronted by bias. Um, yeah, I'll just start with that. Nishka, go for it. Yeah, I, I just don't want uh, there to happen that I will jump into someone uh, speaking. So I was really hesitant to start. Um, yeah, uh, what Marina said, I will second to that and only add that uh, inclusion is like a um, feeling of being welcome, being included, but also including myself. Yeah, there are two aspects. And I think I will, I will just uh, throw a ball to Antonio because uh, some time ago we had a chance to discuss the inclusion from the other part, from the include yourself part. And that is something that uh, um, Antonio wrote a really beautiful article about that uh, we will be maybe distributing later. So Antonio, would you would you would you mind to say something about the self including part of inclusion? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was just also hesitant because I wanted to give space to others as I was already talking a lot. So. Yes, I believe that in, where there are two kinds of in, inclusion. One is more um, related to the infrastructure, let's say, to external factors, which is like, yeah, I don't know. I, I have a disability, so I talk for myself, but uh, because it's my experience, like I don't, I don't want to uh, touch topics that I might not know that well. Uh, so just for that reason. And... Yes, of course, if it's uh, not uh, wheelchair accessible, you might not be allowed to go there. So this is the infrastructural um, aspect of uh, inclusion. But the part that Elishka was mentioning is about the feeling. And it's, uh, yes, what, what I was trying to highlight in my article is that uh, it, 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 it's really complex. Uh, being inclusive, uh, is a hard work because you really need to keep in mind many things to be careful to so many aspects and uh, and it's really easy to make a mistake because you might consider one aspect but not another one you don't know what the other person is living or feeling so uh, it it re it requires a uh, like, like it, it can also be scary for some point of view right just i want to be inclusive but i don't know how to do it and I don't want to do mistakes. The thing that we can do to help to include ourselves is to somehow uh, proactively help the person that wants to be inclusive. And how can we do this? We can do this by understanding, first of all, that it's a person and the intention are 90% good. So even if that person is making a mistake, we we can maybe help understanding it or we can just it, this can be a mistake for us but not for another person so we don't also own the absolute truth so we can just somehow forgive that mistake and not 
react defending ourselves or uh, stepping back because after all who is losing is us because we are missing an opportunity if we feel offended if we step back if we put some distance between us and the other person after all both of us are losing and it's not necessarily uh, true that that person wanted to exclude you i think uh, to be honest for example it happened to me uh, many times in my life that i simply forgot to ask if in a place where there were stairs right uh, i don't know at university some friends were organizing a party inviting me and i did not ask if there were stairs and i could see the people feeling bad about it when i arrived there and i could not walk upstairs it was like uh, they felt bad for it so the same way as i can forget and i live it every day how can it happen? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy that another person cannot think about it. So we don't have to feel excluded. We have to push ourselves and say, hey, can we do something to make it easier for us, to, for me to join, to be part of you? Uh, yeah, again, this is one example related to the infrastructure again, but I, uh, or the disability. But I think this can happen also for uh, other types of inclusion it's not doesn't have to be related to only to my personal experience uh, when we see a situation that is causing us some discomfort i think what we can do is think about sometimes when we did the same mistake or something similar or just a mistake when we maybe offended somebody and we really didn't want to do that and maybe this will help us to be more understanding with the other person and uh, make a step towards them rather than than back. I don't know if I uh, made the point, if I... You on. did. You, you surely did. Thank you very much. I really am glad for all the all the stuff you said. I don't know where to start because I would just a second to maybe most of the points. And uh, trying to self-include ourselves is also part of it. Thank you for highlighting that part. I believe that part of it is kind of the aspects of uh, creating psychologically safe space where we feel like we can express ourselves yeah and I'm, and I'm touching a little bit something that will be on Saturday morning there will be a keynote where I am co-presenting together with uh, Emma together with Seraphin and um, we'll be talking a little bit more about that but uh, yeah expecting the good intention that's that's a really definitely a big part of inclusion isn't it yeah and on 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 the other side of this i wanted to say that organization like organizations thinking about inclusion whether it's red hat or like deaf Conf conference organizing and you know if we like already like know those best practices like make sure there is a wheelchair like like things are wheelchair accessible make sure there is uh, a room for um, breastfeeding parents, make sure like, um, you know, there are um, non-gendered bathrooms, like for, like a lot of it is for um, physical events. Um, but for, for online events, it could be having like um, text, like being written down uh, about like what is being said, right? And, and then that could also need to be optional, uh, like people, like who have attention deficit might actually want it off, like not have it that be, be there by default. So thinking about it from organizational perspective is also really important. And that's also ties really well with like the diversity and inclusion communities that we have at Red Hat, like um, Aliska has mentioned neurodiversity community. Um, there is a, another community that soon is going to be launched uh, for people with disabilities. There, there are many communities we have, and and part of it is, um, like I think that that's where having a, a community where you and other people uh, with similar um, concerns can can talk to each other and can also uh, partner with Red Hat and and bring up those things that that need to be improved. Um, so that like you don't feel alone, and and so that there is this connection with organizational inclusion, uh, like where we're trying to glue this all together. I would add one thing. Um, in in so many ways, in open source, we are in places where where we're expected to take initiative. 
Sometimes inclusion is making it clear how to take that initiative. For example, I mean, the simplest way is a contributor's document, but even in your teams or your, your project or whatever, making, making it clear how someone who might feel like an outsider or might feel like people are excluding them can get involved clearly. And those taking those steps, sometimes it means a little bit of process. Sometimes it means taking a little bit of time to write things down. I find that those steps um, bring more people in who perhaps are not all of the, of the type where they, they can boldly just charge and try things and be willing to, to fail. In, in many of our communities and also many of our teams, people are hesitant to, to speak up in a chat or, or post something for fear that, hey, it's gonna look weird or it's gonna look strange. And, and removing that barrier by, by, you know, whatever the little mechanism is for, for participation is very inclusive. I agree with all of you. Um, thank you. That's awesome. Um, I yes, absolutely. Um, making it easy to contribute in somebody's comfort zone is something that is very helpful um, and very inclusive, um, and helps towards psychological safety. Um, it. Uh, and, and that psychological safety, I think, is what people are aiming towards, that you feel like you can contribute without being laughed at, without uh, people criticizing um, your English if you're a non-native speaker, um, whatever it might be um, that helps you feel um, comfortable and, and welcome and that you have a place where you fit in. Um, so uh one um sorry jump into my notes um do you think um that there is more we can do um especially in a virtual world to be inclusive of folks who perhaps can't make it to conferences or is, the, is there more that we can do? Is there um, things that you think are obviously missing at this point? I've stumped you. Um, we can maybe so, come back to that. No, no, you didn't. Speak. I was thinking how blunt did I want to be or how direct, <laughs> right? Um, this is a know, safe space. You can I be know, direct. I know. I, I guess um, I've, been a, I've been a woman in technology for like 25 years now. And it, it's, we've been talking about this stuff forever. And I'm, I'm almost at the point where I'm like, oh, we, we, we have to stop talking about it and we have to actually start doing it. Right. And I, I feel it's not, it's not that we're not doing it. I just feel like it, it's, I don't know if it's changing anything and I'm worried about that. I don't, I don't see it changing. I, I see us, um, I see more people interested in it and talking about it. Um, but I, I find myself sometimes frustrated by the fact that a lot of the uh, folks coming into the conversation are asking questions that have been answered from very, very long ago. And it's almost like we're, um, it's, it's very similar to a lot of uh, uh, last year during a lot of the Black Lives Movement um, in the United States when um, one of my very, very close friends um, who is an author was on her Instagram and saying, I'm not here to educate white people on why I am uh, repressed. And I feel like, um, I'm not trying to compare this situation with that one, but I feel sometimes I'm in that space where I'm constantly having to answer the same questions over and over again. Um, and I, I'm frustrated by that. That's all. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's me and my true and honest self. Oh, I, I hear you. I've, as I mentioned, I've also been in IT for 
20 something years and those explanations never seem to go away but with the increased interest um and the increased interest from allies it's felt for a very long time that it's been the diverse communities who are discussing this and um, screaming in the wind about it um, but the more allies that we get on board to come and talk about it and spread the the news with their peers and their ilk um, hopefully the less we will have to answer questions that is that is my hope um, Marie I noticed that you unmuted yourself there momentarily I did well I um, I guess I just had a point to missing something I think that was the question and we've been all over the place but um, I still think there is a matter of uh, of representation that's missing. We don't have everyone here yet, uh, at least in the Fedora community. That's how it feels. And um, I think the reason is even, you know, folks like us who are working on making more opportunities, it's really about the culture once people arrive. Are they feeling comfortable once they have arrived in that space? We've made the opportunity for them to be there, but are they comfortable once they're there once they've you know finished that internship once they've done you know xyz thing and and it's over do they feel a part of it and i think it, it does come from um talking to those people more and listening to their stories more and trying to make the spaces that i mean it's a it's an age-old question but right but the representation i think is the point i wanted to really bring up Hey, Justin, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for uh, running a little late there, but got my uh, coffee and my DevConf mug from last year. Nice to see lots of familiar faces again and some new ones too. Um, maybe I should introduce myself too. Um, so my name is Justin Flory. I, um, I, I do a lot of work in the Fedora community where I've been working in the mindshare part of our community with comops and marketing documentation for the last five years. Currently, I'm, I'm working with the on the Fedora Council as the diversity and inclusion advisor there. And recently, I just joined the Chaos Project, um, which does open source metrics uh, as their internal DNI liaison for an upcoming DNI audit on their community. Um, Outside of that, in my day job, I work at the UNICEF Office of Innovation as an open source technical advisor, where I help coach startups and UNICEF country offices on open source best practices and how to be inclusive in building communities or getting involved with existing communities. So thanks. Glad to be here. Thank you, Justin. Um, with, you mentioned, uh, Marie, representation. Um, I, my feeling is that it's getting better, um, for sure. Um, if we look at recent changes, um, at Red Hat with the, uh, women's, the, the, the DNI VP, so Denise retired, um, and it seems like they actually had a, a good number of people to choose from, whereas five years ago, um, I couldn't imagine who else would have taken that role. Um, whereas this, so I believe that we're getting there. It is a bit like pushing a very heavy cart uphill. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure um, like Jen, a lot of us are kind of tired. Um, paraphrasing a little there but just of, of, of the work taken to get there um, are there ways that you could be supported in getting that representation within the Fedora community looking a little bit outside of Red Hat for now well I was just thinking about it a little bit uh, further and I'm like 
we actually have seen increased participation specifically from women. And that was something that we put some effort into. I would say like at our yearly conference, we had a percent increase maybe every year over the six years that I went and I started, maybe there was 10. And the last year that we had an in-person conference, there were maybe 30 or 40. So, you know, that was a span over six years, but that's just one category. It's not very intersectional because it's, to be frank, mostly white European and Indian women that are mm -hmm. um, coming and participating. So um, still it is not fully representative of, you know, the global reach that Fedora has. So how can we, what kind of support can we get? Um, that is a great question. <laughs> um, well, we do outreachy and we have had some really um, good opportunities to connect with some folks who are minorities or underrepresented in our community. But like I was saying before, they don't always stick around and it can be because of, um, I think the fact that it, we're overwhelmingly, um, we have some strong groups in specific areas where it seems like we've done well. I think we're very underrepresented in Africa's and um, some areas in APAC. Seems like Latin America, North America, and Europe, we do pretty great. That's a, a good layout, I think. Justin might be able to uh, confirm or deny. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I was just coming back to that that piece on like what what is missing or what are things that we could do to better fill that gap. And like to me, I I, I think there's two, not that there's only two, but just two kind of pillars here around like one thing is bandwidth and connectivity, knowing that some of us are uh, engineers or system developers, some of us are project managers or event organizers. There's all these different ways that thinking about connectivity and access can, we can build that into the work that we do. As system developers and engineers, how often do we take into that consideration of this use case or different kinds of use cases that are different from our own or even a single client or, or single type of end user? Because open source goes beyond just those, those often it will go beyond just that one client or just that one type of end user. So really trying to think about how often do we take those considerations and in actively instead of passively? How do we try to build those perspectives into our projects? And then if you're an event organizer, thinking about platforms for engaging your community, trying to think about low bandwidth platforms for people who have problems with connectivity is a huge thing, um, which kind of feeds into the second piece, I think, is like uh, multiple means of engagement. Because in Fedora, we have all these multiple decentralized pockets in the community. And uh, you know, I think the feeling on the Fedora Council is that, well, we just can't manage all these different communities and all the platforms and all the places because it's just, it, it's huge. It's a lot of work. So what we have to do is empower and train people who we feel like are good models of the, or good stewards of our community values and, and our project to go and lead in those spaces. So bringing it back to like, what can we do better? How can we be more inclusive? It's like mentorship, helping train people up, just like Steph was saying with documentation earlier, like that's a huge, that's one huge piece of that, being able to train people up to fill in these roles and empower them with the knowledge they need to get to find that confidence. That's, that's really important. Uh, I just want to bring it one step further. I'm reading an interesting book called Hacking Diversity. I don't know if anyone's read this book. Um, I just started it, so I'm not going to give a, a like a glowing review or anything, but the author makes a really interesting point about um, also like when we come to new spaces or we're trying to create these opportunities that we're also not imposing our culture on these other places as we do that so that we're allowing it to, to be a way that they're using the way that they're using the technology is best for them, not best for us. Uh, so that's, um, it's called, it's right here, Hacking Diversity. And it's kind of, a, um, it seems like an academic, it's a little bit tough to read. 
Um, but it's interesting so far, and I think that's a good point. Like when we bring our open source thing, we kind of have a culture that goes with it um, that is maybe central around, you know, European and white and North American culture. said something that actually pinged my brain a little bit because we I was working on another conference and we were talking about um, collecting DNI information and how to do that in a way that wouldn't be offensive um, and and not you know like what's the language that we're meant to use and we actually had a, a long conversation about the fact that the entire organizing team is from the United States and how we view um, what that word means is different for other countries and we wanted it to be a global conference. And so um, if, if you're asking uh, somebody if they consider themselves diverse and they're from India and they, they, they're not in India, but they are in the States, it, it's, a, it's a hard question to figure out how to ask somebody to get the answer that you're looking for. And if you're not careful as an organizer, you could become very, uh, focused on what your lived experience is and not where somebody else might be and how they think about themselves. Um, I am going to read that book. Thank you for sharing it. I'm also going to read that book. Thank you for joining us, Steph. Um, uh, for Red Hatters, there's a book club in Oslo around that. We just started it this week, so you could join us if you want. Please. Okay. Will do. Um, so Amy's mentioning that uh, in the OpenStack diversity surveys, they quest asked people if they felt they were a minority. Um, I think that's that's interesting. I know um, looking at it from a uh, corporate point of view. Asking those questions, it's easy to, um, there's certain aspects of diversity that are easy to see, um, male, female, uh, color, race, um, but there are many um, hidden aspects of diversity, I think, that are more difficult to ask about and that people are less likely to be honest about. I think there's more stigma attached to those. Amy, how did you handle that? Yeah, so we, this was our original survey in 2017, and we had a very um, diverse and global group putting the survey together. And we realized we couldn't ask everybody necessarily, are you this race? Or are you that race? Um, so we came down to having to ask for feelings. And to make the point that you just mentioned, Someone in India may be the majority, but when they come to the United States, they're a minority. So it was, do you feel like you're a minority in your group or project or your company or whatever? So, you know, we took it to that next level. Even when we updated the survey two years ago now, we wanted to add more racial questions and we could not find a global list of ethnicities to use because the only ones we could find were the US census, which again, were biased. So we couldn't, so even though we wanted to ask more specifically, you know, about race, we couldn't or ethnicity. So we again went with the feelings because, you know, it doesn't matter if you are the majority in one place, if where you currently are, you are a minority and therefore you feel like a minority. So that's why we ended up going more with feelings than with statistics right there. Um, we also tend to do a lot of questions that are, you know, here's a choice, but also an other so that people can fill it in. It does mean more and work on the back end. And we actually utilized chaos, which I'm a member of the DNI group with Justin there, you know, and had people sign NDAs to actually go through the information. Um, 
So you can take advantage of projects like Chaos who do metricing when you do need to go to open-ended, but sometimes what you run into is unless you have someone who's really going through and looking all the tags and all the answers, you have two people with very similar questions. If you just, I mean, answers. And if you just look at the responses and they're slightly different, someone might miss that they're actually talking about the same thing. Um, so a lot of work goes into being more open with open-ended questions, but I think the data in the end is valuable. Um, and then when we try to take these DNI surveys out into the larger world, like we were tweeting, we were doing everything we could get to it. We had at the same time, we have to be anonymous. And there were some responses that I hope we're not part of my community and I really do not feel we're part of my community, but it still felt bad reading them as survey results. I think it was just someone who said, saw a DNI survey go bad on Twitter that people were asking to, you know, for responses for, and they answered, you know, so they could be hurtful because at least as someone in my community, I have never seen anyone be hurtful like that in the community. I think um, anonymity has a lot to answer for. Um, people say stuff as they think they can. Um, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to reading the link that Jason just shared in the chat um, around the learnings from um, obviously, I can't read that now. Um, Maybe do you want me just to summarize that? Would that be helpful? That would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so the context for this was the Linux Foundation reached out to the Chaos DNI working group because they wanted to better understand, um, I don't know if this was for like a KubeCon or a Linux Fest. I, I don't know what event it was. I, I don't remember that, but they wanted to better understand their attendees. And so they had run some questions that, that they wanted us to look at. We shared feedback, they ran the questions, and they did get some feedback from people who filled out the, the registration form. And the key takeaways or recommendations that we made um, that I think were most helpful was we were asking for clarification from people who were filling it out to leave an opportunity to, to say if, the, if these questions felt intrusive. If they had that feedback, there was a way for them to share that. Um, also, reframing the question about people's identities into how we can better accommodate people. Like, how can we better help you attend versus tell us what you have and then, or tell us your 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 disability and that might not be able, that might not be everything you need to know how to accommodate them. The last thing was trying to group the question away from the demographic questions and trying to group them in other categories. Like, so if you're asking about food for your event, we'll group food, uh, like food to intolerance questions with food questions. Don't group them in like a um, about about you or about about the person filling out the form. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but those were some key things that we got from the feedback there. And I thought were really interesting about how to approach asking these questions. It's a very interesting approach. Um, Marina also shared something in the chat um, around uh, questions. I think this is, comes from, it seems like it comes from Summit or from DevConf, uh, Marina. Do you want to expand on that? Uh, yes. So that question that I shared in chat, that comes from uh, Red Hat Summit. Uh, question for uh, when people were putting in proposals, uh, you know, like just understanding that diversity, like being from underrepresented groups could spend so many uh, different dimensions. And some of them, there are restrictions. Like, I, I don't believe you can ask uh, if a person identifies uh, uh, as a um, uh, somebody in the LGBTQ community in Europe, for example, right? Uh, so, 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 you know, while we're like mostly across the globe comfortable with being asked our gender, 
um, even race and ethnicity are a lot more sensitive, for example, in Europe. And so, so, so basically we were looking for a way to, I, I like to know if people who are putting in proposals are from an underrepresented group without them having to disclose any personal information and was being like as broad. Um, you know, I really like what Amy said about like, how do you feel, right? And and so being as broad as possible, uh, but 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 also giving people some I like idea, right? Like something to hang on to. And so we ended up with this question that that basically uh asked if they belong to one or more under groups underrepresented in the technology industry and then said that they include but are not limited to people with disabilities people with neurological differences um and and so on and also like you know we did some like very broad net things like people who don't have higher education or people who are first generation college students um but but also just like you know, hopefully being clear that that it's not limited to this list. This is just examples. And then people just had to say like, yes, no, prefer not to answer. And 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 for DEF CONF, what we've been doing is uh, for DEF CONF CZ, we've only asked for gender um, uh, and of course, op always optional. And uh, for uh, DEF CONF US, we've had both gender and uh, race ethnicity questions. Yeah, you're not allowed to, um, it's certainly at interview, you're not even allowed to ask if somebody is married um, in, in Europe. So we've had the cats making a, an appearance and it's nice to see the dogs also represented there, Amy. I had a quick question um, and I dropped it in the chat too. Um, have folks who uphold code of conducts are or do moderation on a variety of platforms, have you seen an increase in incidents over the past year during COVID slash culture wars? I'll answer that from Open Infra Foundation. Um, we were really expecting issues when we brought up the inclusive naming and we had a lot of public meetings at our PTG, our forum, and even at Summit except for one or two people, we could explain to them where we were coming from that we weren't trying to censor anybody, but you know where this was coming from. And I think except for one person who did not want to actually meet with us anonymously, because again, going back to people protect themselves in anonymity, we, we said, we don't want to email with you. We are willing to meet with you and discuss this and see your point of view, but they weren't willing to. Um, but yet at the same time, we thought those were the be going to be the most contentious sessions to take place. And everyone was polite and well-behaved except for a couple of people in either pad. Um, so no one who was willing to show their face really objected or caused any issues. Um, so I think the issues we're going to see going forward are more of those type issues because of COVID, because we've decided to implement these type of things during, and it just happens to be during COVID. So as we implement naming and other efforts similar, there are going to be people who disagree. But again, I do not think those are COVID or because people are locked up in their house type issues. The reason I bring it up is because in Fedora, we absolutely have seen that we are we are working on a new code of conduct, but it hasn't been rolled out yet. We had over two times the number of code of conduct incidents in 2020 as we did in 2019. Yeah, CentOS <clears throat> was looking at your code of conduct to improve theirs. Um, yep. Up until this point, they have not had at least anywhere for people to go with code of conduct issues and they're working on that so interesting that because i mean model rich, with yeah board is so good and then sent to us had nothing um so they are looking to improve what they're doing well i think it's because fedora is a, a more of a people community i think centos is uh it's large community but it's less people focused so i think there's more of that interpersonal dynamics people feel personally invested and like their identities are wrapped up with fedora so those emotions 
kind of start coming out. But I mean, we had incidents over a variety of, of topics. I mean, everything from gender identity to racial topics to people, um, you know, mental health topics, like uh, really a broad scope of things um, occurring. And I think it's because the Fedora community is just so large. And also I think it's because we have the code of conduct and we've encouraged people to use it. And uh, they're like doing that. <laughs> it's become a, a little bit more than what it used to be. So uh, just curious if other community organizers are seeing even those types of conflicts, maybe without, you know, a code of conduct in place, just moderating, like misbehaving, that kind of stuff. I wonder if that's also um, due to people feeling more comfortable complaining about it. The, you know, for most of my IT career, it's been, oh, well, that's just, that's just the way it is. There's no point in complaining about it because I'll be thought of as a weak and feeble woman who can't stand up for herself. I am anything but. Um, but, you know, so I think I do wonder if that's because people, you've created the safety of being able to report it so people are um, making the most of, of being able to report it and, and feeling safe. And so that's a compliment in many ways that people are able, feel able to um, complete, to uh, complain. Um, so uh, Jen has just pinged that we have two minutes left to the session. Um, so yes, I am going to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, this was a really enlightening conversation as it was last year. Um, I. Uh, look forward to doing more of these hopefully maybe even a combo of uh, virtual and in person and i would love to see more of these at other events too um, i think that this is something that we should be advocating for at many of our events on the first day the opportunity for people to talk to meet and chat about these things um, I think this has been fantastic. Thank you all so much for your time. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or feedback on, on any of the things that we've talked about today. Um, it's been a real pleasure um, and thank you very much for coming.